Hello, I'm Bob Trebshaw. I'd like to talk to you today about why I speak the way I do. As you may have gathered from earlier videos, I don't speak using a standard Southern English accent. And that's because my parents were born and brought up in Leicester, and I too spent my junior school years in Leicestershire, and then returned to the county in 1986. Now, bear in mind that dialects always evolve, and the research I'm summarising in this video was done in the 1980s and maybe 1990s, so it's more a history of Leicestershire dialect and accent, rather than about, say, the developments of the last 20 or 30 years. Now, in marked contrast to most other parts of Britain, the dialects of the East Midlands have received almost no study, and this is especially true for Leicestershire, because apart from some sketchy detail provided in national surveys, the only other recent publications have been restricted to the dialect of Leicester City itself, and ignores the wide diversity elsewhere in the county, which includes, for instance, the very distinctive pronunciation of the Shepshed and Colville area to the northwest of Charnwood Forest, and also the transition to the quite different Warwickshire pronunciation in the Hinckley area. A, shall we say, softened version of the Leicester City dialect can be found upstream and downstream along the Saw Valley and into the Reek Valley towards Melton Mowbray. And this accent is closely related to other accents of the Trent Valley and its tributaries, such as the Erewash Valley between Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire. So, for example, the greeting, Hey up, up considered by many to be unique to Leicester, is used as far away as Ilkeston. Uh, the sort of links between dialect and roots and topography mean that the dialect in the Vale of Beaver is similar on both the Leicestershire and Nottinghamshire sides. And in the east part of Leicestershire, extending all the way into Rutland, the dialect is much closer to the very different Northamptonshire one, although in the eastern part of Rutland there were influences from Lincolnshire too. And no surprise, the accents on both banks of the River Welland, which forms the Leicestershire-Northamptonshire boundary around Market Harbour, also mixes Leicestershire with the very different Northamptonshire pronunciation. However, in this case, the Northamptonshire influences drop off sharply outside the fairly narrow Welland Valley and don't extend far into Leicestershire. What's the difference between Leicestershire and Northamptonshire and, say, Warwickshire accents? Well, in a word, a lot. Um, Northamptonshire and Warwickshire are considered southern accents, whereas Leicestershire is often referred to as a northern accent. But it's not. It's part of a group of dialects correctly referred to as Central English, which spans West Midlands and the East Midlands. Now, southern and, shall we say, prestige English, southern standard English, and received pronunciation, use what is called the rhotic R, I will visit a castle and take a bath after cutting the grass. Whereas somebody from down south will talk about castles and baths and grass. They will also emphasise the R in car and far, whereas I won't. The technical term is rotic, so I'm a non-rotic speaker. Indeed, I might be regarded as anti-rotic when among speakers of Southern English, using the rotic pronunciation to infer some sort of self-appointed prestige. While the coming together of large numbers of people in factories in the second half of the 19th century created the very distinctive urban dialects such as Brummie and Geordie, at the same time improvements in the national primary education, starting around 1870, were a formidable anti-dialect movement. School teachers imposed standard English, and indeed teachers' middle-class distaste for dialect has been maintained until the present day and as a positive opposition to dialect was incorporated into the national curriculum in 1993. In general, dialect speech has few champions, as it's associated with the rural and urban working classes, even though it was also spoken by the middle classes. So it falls outside the scope of middle-class nostalgia for an imaginary idyllic England that's pervaded interest in the past in the last century or so. Rural parts of the East Midlands, especially Leicestershire and Rutland, have been increasingly settled by folks from the South East who have no interest in local pronunciation. So in places such as Oakham, it is now rare to hear the Rutland dialect spoken. Now, I'm not a dialect specialist, and I struggle with the formal linguistic terminology for describing subtle differences between phonemes and the ever-changing vowel shifts. But allow me to attempt some sort of guide to traditional Leicester and Leicestershire dialect and pronunciation. 
Throughout East Midlands, vowel pronunciation is comparatively plain and unadorned compared to, let's call it, the ornate vowel distortions of some accents. So in the West Country, they say moi for my, and Geordie says pleat for plate, or you get the sing-song intonation of the West Midlands dialects and the nasal tendencies of scouse. Frankly, the main characteristic of Leicester pronunciation is laziness, specifically avoidance of exertion to reconfigure the mouth. So length and strength become length and strength, with becomes we, and becomes n. F and V sound sometimes change to N, so never heard of it becomes never heard on it. More extreme contractions include do you becoming just jur. Anything shrinks to oat, and nothing reduces to nout. And the Leicestershire forms of grammar, so the verbs was and where, was and were, are often used in ways that standard English would regard as wrong. So the past tense of the verb to be becomes I were, he were, she were, and they were. Although, exceptionally, was is used. But when standard English would use were. As in, was you want to note? Similarly, come is substituted for came. Gen for gave. Done for did. And node for new. Us is substituted for our, and can also be substituted for me, as in gives us a fag. Although Leicester dialect includes some frequently used double negatives, such as I don't know note about it, and you can't do note about it, generally grammar follows pronunciation in usually taking the line of least resistance. My often changes to me, as in, where's my shoes? What often replaces the relative pronouns which, who and whom, so that that comic what I read, that man what passed me, and that girl what I saw. Sometimes us, pronounced more like us, replaces who in Imus limps, or er as speaks posh, and who are changes to them as is. Plural subjects can be used with singular verbs in expressions such as there ain't many kecks left, and similarly, them often replaces those, as in, ooh, them's good uns. The simple past form is usually substituted for the past participle, so, A's at the last cob, who's drank it all, we done it, I seen him yesterday. He's wrote a letter. Cats fell in the water. Earth trod in some mud. And it stunk. In many dialects, strong verbs, by which I mean those that change their internal vowel to form the past tense, as with swim and swam, teach, taught, tell, told, and they often change to weak verbs with the endings ed, d or t added to form the past tense. So, er knowed him all right. I knowed him for ten year. I told him. It growed. I catched him when he popped round this morning. However, watch out for it only seemed like yesterday. And you kin me too much. I about giving up on you. And oh, he gave him a good hiding. Off is only used as an adverb, so the preposition off changes to off of, as in, I bought it off him up the road. And no, he had his money took off of him. Means he had his money deducted, and the implication is that this was his dull money. Off also appears as an intensive particle when start is used as a noun in for a start off. To add emphasis, an object pronoun such as him or her is used. So her with gloves on. An him with rolls. And when asking questions, the opening R is often omitted. So, you and Anori, you're not coming. Now, the distinction between shall and will has long been blurred in standard English because of the contraction to double L. However, older speakers of Leicester dialect sometimes added emphasis to interrogative commands by using forms such as shall you come? 
Well, shall you close the door, please? Even though standard English is, will you come, and will you close the door, please? However, this usage seems to have died out in the 1980s. Before you in bus, custom, son, is pronounced uh, so love and son. But there are exceptions, such as mother, bugger, come. Now, for added confusion, both came and comb are also pronounced come. The short A and rotic R is pronounced, well, I'd say, as written. So after, plaster, grass, glass, brass, ask, laughter, bath, alabaster, broadcast, aircraft. And certainly not the Southern English after, plaster, grass, glass, brass, ask, laughter, bath, alabaster, broadcast, aircraft. Uh, in the city, although I think less in the county, the R is dropped in work, which becomes Wook. My mother worked in the office of shoemaking companies in the early 1950s. On most days, there was a steady stream of men putting their head around the office door and saying, Got any Wook? In my experience, it's more or less a thing to say, See after Wook, with all the R sounds dropped. In the suburbs and villages, it's after work but this may be a gentrification of the county dialect influenced by radio and TV. What most dialect experts miss is that Leicester dialect is not just about vowel sounds. Midlands dialects stress words differently to Southern English. Note that I said after, alabaster, aircraft, broadcast, with the stress on the final syllable. And this is in contrast to Southern English, which has laughter, alabaster, aircraft, broadcast, and so forth. Now this means folks know if you're really from Leicester if you refer to a major route out of the city heading northeast as Catherine Street and not Catherine Street. And you're from Leicester if you say the ending with the emphasis on the final short A. Yeah, Leicester. Whereas Leicestershire people will say Leicester. Um, slightly more of an R at the end and subtle changes to that final ER. This shift in stress to the final syllable I think is the most difficult for non-native speakers of Midlands dialects to adapt to. Indeed, I'm not convinced that most voice coaches for actors and such like are even aware of these aspects of Midlands pronunciation. Let's get back to vowels. AL is, usually sounds more like the OL of pole, so alter, fault, false. Want becomes won't, swan becomes swan, Shake becomes shek, make becomes mech, take becomes tech, and great becomes gret. Av becomes av, but have you becomes aya. New is pronounced new, likewise tune becomes tune. Bloody becomes bloody, and girl becomes gal. And as Leicester is something of a lazy accent, dropping phonemes seemingly wherever possible, it's no surprise that the aspirate H is usually omitted. Where this follows the, the final E of the is lengthened, so the, ha the house becomes the house. Although in the city, house becomes more like arse. You're coming round our arse, afters. The effort needed to enunciate the medial G of length and strength is... Well, incompatible with Leicester speech, so, as I've already said, these become length and strength. Likewise, the medial D of could not, did not, should not, would not is always dropped, becoming couldn't, didn't, shunt, wouldn't. The medial TH in clothes is omitted, so it becomes clothes. The medial L in only is dropped to become only. Other medial syllables which are usually omitted include the ER in generally, which becomes generally, and properly becomes properly, direction becomes direction, collection becomes collection, and regular becomes regular. Now you once had to work hard to convince a Leicester speaker that slippy is not a proper word and should be written slippery, but before you email I do know that the Oxford English Dictionary now includes slippy because of its extensive, quote, informal use. A final OW is usually omitted too, so window becomes winder, and so we can have father's a window cleaner, arrow becomes arrow, and follow becomes follow. The Y at the end of words usually becomes e, eh, so mucky and lucky become mucky and lucky. 
The G of an ING ending is also always omitted, so talking becomes talking. Uh, TH at the end of words is usually dropped, so with becomes we. And some terminal truncations are even more severe. The final self in yourself and myself is just contracted to you and me. So where you washed ya? Or I dressed me. Likewise, afterwards sometimes contracts to after. We'd better do that after. Thanks is seriously truncated to ta. But tatars is to say goodbye. Especially when encouraging babies to speak, such as say tatars to grandma. And note the no d in the middle of grandmother. Another contraction is to drop adverbs such as there and that, as in they can't get. Adverbs are often used differently to standard English. E were well, that poorly. And the response to it's a nice day could be it is that or it isn't all. And similarly adjectives can be swapped, as in a fortnight since, meaning a fortnight ago. Conjunctions sometimes swap too, such as as how, replacing that. So you get, you know as how he's tight-fisted. Or conjunctions can be added for emphasis, as in, same as I said. And to add emphasis to the end of sentences, in it is often added to the end of an interrogative instruction, as in, cool, it ain't half art, in it. Emphasis is also achieved by repetition, as in the previous example, or in construction such as, you have got a big gob, you have, which has a sense of you offer your opinion too readily, rather than a literal description of someone's oral cavity. Another way of adding emphasis also changes the construction of sentences, as in, he's a right in this Ted. Now be said, with the sense of that's enough, is another way of adding emphasis. I've told you, you're not having any more sweets. Now, be said. Expressions of surprise were often euphemisms. I recall my father's mother, who was born in Leicester, well, before the First World War, coming out with, oh, you beaut. This was a contraction for, oh, you beauty, which in turn was, shall we say, a substitution for, oh, you bugger, as working men are inclined to remark, and they still do. There's two words that Leicester and Leicestershire folks only realise are not standard English if they move to other parts of the country. Everyone in the area knows what having a Mardi means, or how annoying Mardi kids are. Even the Oxford English Dictionary has caught up with this one, although inaccurately deeming it Northern English. The OED definition is a sulky mood or fit of petulant bad bit temper. <clears throat> Mardi says it all so much better. Back in the days before tea bags and the ritual of making tea in a teapot was always known as mashing some tea. My father was frequently called in from the garden by my mother saying, Jeff, the tea's mashing. I believe mashing tea is, or was, also commonly used in Yorkshire and Lancashire. But the demise of teapots means this phrase is no longer needed. And I can't finish without mentioning a up mid up as an informal greeting. And not just as a greeting. Go to Leicester Market to buy some fruit and veg, and the stallholder is likely to respond to being given some money by saying, Thanks, me duck. No waterfowl were involved. This is a direct counterpart to addressing a judge as me lord, rather than in full as my lord. Me duck goes back to when the word duke was pronounced the same way originally spelt in Norman French, that is, duck. Yes, at one time there was a duck of Normandy. Uh, I think you can guess why those sort of ducks became dukes. But the contracted greeting, Midduck, survived. Ta for watching, Midduck!